Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 45th episode of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, a podcast all about the subject of antinatalism created by antinatalists. My name is Amanda Oldfansukanik, formerly known as Feverwolf Films on YouTube. And I'm Mark J. Maharaj, also known as Question Mark on YouTube. And today, we're speaking with three child-free powerhouse podcasters and entrepreneurs, Isabel Firecracker, Kristen Tetsy, and Lenora Fay, also known as the Child-Free Girls. Welcome, Child-Free Girls, to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Nice to be Thank here. you. Happy to be here. Uh, we have a full house today. This is so awesome. I don't, I don't really think we've ever had this many people on one episode. So this is really, maybe except for the first episode. So this is really exciting. Um, I was wondering if we could just start by just having each of you introduce yourselves and maybe say a little something about, um, you know, the work that each of you do within the child-free world. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, hi, I'm Isabel Firecracker. Um, I am a coach for child-free women. So I'm child-free myself, of course. And what I do as a coach for Talk for Women is I help um, women who have made the decision, the conscious decision to not have children, to get uh, to work through their feelings of maybe guilt, shame, insecurities, even anger. Uh, I have a, also a, a podcast called uh, The Honest Supper. I had actually, I ended that podcast already, and it was it was a, a podcast in which I explore the lives of, of just different Talk for Women from around the world. Um, I'm part of Topic Girls, of course, which is also a, pod a podcast and web series with uh, Eleonora and Kristen here. Um, regarding, I don't think like that we, each of us has like a specific role within Topic Girls. I think it's, it's, it's this such, is a collaboration in, in every single sense of the word, I would say. Um, we do almost everything like all of us. Um, and if we don't do it ourselves, we sort of like give our um, friends here the input. So it's, it's more like that. But I'm Kristen Tetsy and uh, I'm, I guess if I were to say what I am, I'm a writer, I've been writing forever, um, primarily fiction, but I was a journalist for a while. Um, like most people, I, you know, have some stuff that I'm putting out on Medium. Um, I pretty much like to write about everything, but it's really important to me to write things that are also in defense of or in explanation of the child-free perspective and whether that's on Medium or um, when I was working for the newspaper, I think I might've been one of the first people at that paper to inject an article um, about the decision to not have kids. So that was a, like a little triumph. Uh, so I try to put it in where I can, including in fiction, there'll always be a character who's either feeling unhappy with her uh, inertia inspired decision to be a parent or she'll feel pressured to be a parent or she will adamantly not want kids and that will be a problem just because a lot of times the child preposition does involve that kind of conflict and that kind of stress and pressure so I like to try to um, I like to try to represent that because you don't see that you know, the only difficulties you see when it comes to parenthood are people who want kids and can't have them and it's <laughs> pretty heavy the other way around too. So I like try to, to put that in what I write in, in some ways, you know, it's not like an overwhelming weight of, you know, eh, it's just part of the character usually. <laughs> That's what I do. Hi, my name is Lenora Faye. I am a child-free lifestyle content creator, speaker, and moderator. I am one of the co-founders of the Child-Free Convention, which had, we were formerly known as the Virtual Child-Free Conference. And we hosted that in uh, back in July. And I also have a morning show on Clubhouse through Child Free Club called Child Free Morning Chat. And I have a Child Free Lifestyle, a Child Free Lifestyle brand called The Bitchy Bookkeeper, which brings positive awareness and creates events and entertainment for the Child Free by Choice community. What's the common usage of, because some people say uh, Child Free, Child Free by Choice, uh, Child Free Movement. What, what term do you guys use? I think as a, co a, like a collector for child-free girls, we do focus on child-free by choice. The three of us personally, I mean, I'll speak for myself. I chose not to have children. I didn't ever want to have kids. And so individually, I focus mostly on the by choice conversation because out of all of the different scenarios, there seems to be the, less rep the least representation for by choice. Like, I didn't ever want to have kids. That seems to be the least uh, content available for from that perspective mm -hmm. and you know f for as far as a podcast it goes 
as a collective, we do focus on the by choice conversation. I mean, we, we talk with them, everybody, but yeah. that is, you know, um, are there different, how we identify ourselves. Are there, are there different subcategories within the child free movement? Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah, wow. I was going really? to say, gonna say um, you know, regarding the child free and then like the by choice, it's because there, there are people who use the word child free and child less. That's yes, that was the other one. Yeah. And it's not the same thing. So some people say child free by choice because it's easier for people who use both words interchangeably to understand that it's the conscious decision and not the infertility sort of path that didn't lead me to having children. Followed by acceptance. And I think that's why I used to think that it was either child free or childless and there was nothing in between. Uh, but in, in doing this podcast and in talking to people we've talked to, uh, I've learned that there's also the, the category, I guess, or the subdivision, <laughs> um, someone who wanted kids, tried to have kids, couldn't have kids, and has learned to embrace and enjoy their life without kids. Oh, wow. And that's sort of, in turn, become its own identity as yeah. a subdivision uh, yeah. of the child-free world. Interesting. Offered by circumstance. I yeah. Yeah. Call it. The other thing I just want to, just so I can get the timeline right, um, if we could go quickly through uh, everyone as well, like um, when did you become child-free or affirmed it? Um, like how many years have you been child-free or you know, started using the term or, yeah. I'll go since I'm already not on mute. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, I never actively wanted children, but I definitely knew I actively didn't when it became something the person I was married to at the time wanted. And I was like, no, <laughs> uh, that pretty much affirmed it for me. And so I was probably about 21 and now I'm 47. So for like 20 something non-math years. <laughs> I was like, crap, I have to do math now too. <laughs> As a child, I knew I didn't want to be a mother, but it wasn't until I was 22 that I realized, like actually realized I had a choice. I just thought, okay, well, you know, people keep saying you're going to meet somebody. So I thought, I guess it's going to have to happen. I didn't want it to happen, but 22 years old, I was like, it just, it just all of a sudden hit me that, oh, people get to choose. And and at that moment, I felt peace. And so that was when I was like, I, I'm, I'm not going down that road. And I'll be 39 in December. So you do the math. <laughs> um, that's how long I've been child free. I didn't know the term though until 2018. I didn't know there was a term child free. So, but I had made the decision to not have children at 22. So that was my experience. My experience was very different. I always thought I was going to be a mother because that's what people and like society and culturally what was expected of me I'm Colombian so being like South American is just like the pressure is is a lot um stronger down here I would say um but I dread I mean I didn't dread it in the sense that I was like oh, do I really have to do this it was more like uh oh, kids and then I realized that I had a choice when I was 34 that was only four years ago and as soon as I realized the choice I, I had the choice I was like this is this is what I'm not going to do <laughs> And I've been calling myself child free since then. So four years. Exactly. Wow. Well, I, I think it's very safe to say, I don't know if you, you, all of you think of yourselves this way, but I think it's safe to say that all of you are entrepreneurs of the child free world. I mean, you've really, each of you taken it, it on in different ways and are, you know, constantly producing content. And I mean, it, and it, it's, it's really, I know, as I was doing research for this episode, I mean, it really is incredible. There's so much pr production, so much activism, so much activity, and it's, it's extraordinary. Um, and I could honestly spend, you know, hours just talking to each one of you about each of, you know, your projects. And so I, I have to apologize just for the sake of time being a little selective today. It'd be amazing to do one-on-one -on -one interviews with each of you. I don't know if, it, if, if you've ever done that. Have, have each of you been interviewed individually ever or, or only as a group? Yeah, on, on Isabel's podcast. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's how we I'd love to be next. on yours. Isabel, Kristen, and, uh, and, and Lenora, why are you or are you not antinatalists? And can each of you give some thoughts as to how you would define antinatalism? That's an interesting question uh, because I've been having some, been doing a lot of um, reflecting uh, lately on some things that I've been reading about uh, that has to do with sustainability and like population growth. 
I don't consider myself an antenatalist. To be honest, I've always been like, you want to have kids, do your thing. Hopefully you're going to think about it first. Hopefully you're going to really reflect into what it is to have a child, all the responsibilities that that carries and not only financial, but just emotional and the energy and the time. And if you consciously want to have a child, knowing that you're going to be able to provide to that child what it deserves, then go for it, right? That's sort of, it's been like a little bit my thought, right? Um, I don't think everyone's meant to be a parent, for sure. Um, but it's like, you know, you do your thing and I'll do mine. Mine is I don't want any children. Um, so I don't really consider myself an antenatalist, but I've been reading up on the numbers of project, I mean, the growth population, um, the, sorry, the population growth projections that were released by UN and it's alarming to say the least um it's something insane like it's going to be like 11 billion people in this world by by 2100 like by by 2100 or 2100 I'm not going to be here I think <laughs> but I can't I can't help to think about the next generations. Um, if I had a child now, that child would probably live 80 years or a little bit less. I mean, and it's just like, it's daunting to think that we're putting so much pressure on our resources and it's already happening. I didn't know there was a thing called, um, it's something that Greenpeace put out the other day. It's sort of like the day of the year in which all the resources of the, of the earth have been consumed for a whole year. And so after that, we're actually consuming more than we actually have. And that, that day, this year was July 17th. So by July 17th, the world had consumed the resources for a whole, full year. So what we're doing now is we're actually sort of taking a credit on next year and next year. And this is gonna keep happening until there's nothing. I mean, and the problem about, I mean, the one thing that really bothers me about that, and this is why sometimes I'm like, maybe I should definitely be more people. I mean, I would be, it would be interesting for people to really think about this like really well. And, and the one thing that really bothers me about this is that the people who are going to really suffer the consequences of this are people who have, who are considered poor or people who don't have like resources, like rich people, they're gonna be okay. We're gonna be fine, but we're talking about a very small percentage of the population. So as always, it's it's the people who have the, the least resources that are going to be the ones who are really going to be suffering. So it seems to me that the future of Earth, if we keep populating the way that we've been doing it so far, is just bleak, to say the least. And what does antinatalism mean to me? It just means that um, people should stop reproducing. <laughs> just to, to give earth a little bit more oxygen, not like literally oxygen, also literally oxygen, just sort of like give life a break. But life, I mean, animals and plants and, and everything around us. And um, yeah, that's what it means to me. I don't know if I'm a little bit confused about that. But. Yeah, I guess I, I, I never think of antinatalism as a um, temporary, thing like a like almost like deforestation or not deforestation whatever it is when they burn a little bit of the forest in order to prevent future fires like just kind of thinning the forest to to help it basically um i think of antinatalism as a permanent solution for the planet i guess as in everybody stops having babies let the human race die out and i am not an antinatalist because i first of all think that's People who want children will have children and there's no way in hell people can be convinced to stop reproducing if they want to reproduce. Um, and even if I did believe that everyone should stop reproducing, and I'm not saying I don't think they should, I'm just saying that even if that were my goal, um, it would seem too extreme for people to for the people you're trying to persuade or for the people I would be trying to persuade to actually uh, embrace. I think it would be easy to reach the people who are already concerned about uh, overpopulation and the environment and everything, but it seems like the people who you really don't want reproducing and who you know won't change their minds 
are the ones who will think that's like um, government's trying to maybe get vaccinated, you know, um, they'll just think it's over control. Like they, they won't even, it won't get in there anywhere, uh, which is one of the things I like about the child-free conversation because it's a little bit um, less threatening to them, I think. And at the very least, it does um, let people know who otherwise didn't know that having kids is a choice, that they don't have to just kind of follow this life script and have kids. And I think the more people who know it's a choice, um, the more likely there are people who will decide not to because they'll start thinking about it when they might not have before. So that I think will help reduce the number of people who would have kids. Um, I totally agree there should be fewer people. The population growth is, you know, people always talk about population growth as if as if it's not going to happen if some of us don't have kids. Like, what if everybody stops having kids? What about the human race? Clearly, the human race is not in danger from a few people not having kids or even from three quarters of the people currently having kids not having kids because it just keeps exponentially growing so much that thinning it out significantly would do no harm to the human race at all. And then they would just keep reproducing anyway. I think it would be cool if there were, and this is just as drastic and um, never gonna happen as antenatal, as, as a large, you know, just dying out of the population. It would be cool if there could be some sort of, mm, that's China, Never mind. <laughs> if, there, <laughs> if there were a reasonable way to say only in the whole world, not just one country, not like some weird um, dystopian thing, even though it would be dystopian, but just some sort of, hey, for the sake of the planet, only X number of children can be born. And it doesn't mean we're gonna kill extra babies born. It just means that somehow <laughs> a certain number of people, kind of like the magic 44 who go to heaven in, in some situation, I know there's no good way to do it. There's always gonna be some ruling class or ruling race who's gonna decide if something like that did happen that somebody would suffer for it or they'd only pick a certain, assuming everything were fair and people were good and it was really about the planet and they made all things equal and all different kinds of people, um, that would be ideal, but that's also not gonna happen. Uh, I do think it wouldn't be a tragedy if the human race died out. That's probably as close as I get to antinatalism. Um, I don't, when people say, what about this species? I just say, what about it? Like, who cares? What, to what end do we need to continue to survive? I don't, I don't think there's an answer to that. No, no, thank you for your thoughts. That, that was really interesting. Uh, Lenora? <laughs> I was waiting for Christy to dig herself out of the China hole. <laughs> that was so funny. I loved it. Um, okay. I, I like this question because it makes me think, and I echo both of what Kristen and Isabel said, you know, as far as, like, I have no attachment to the human race. Um, I also recognize that I live in Western Canada, so I feel like I have plenty of space, plenty of resources, and I identify as pro-choice because I believe that everyone should, you know, have the choice. If you wanna have children, think about it. Like what's already been said, if you don't wanna have kids, really good choice and don't have them. You know, I, I feel that the reason why I'm not an antinatalist is because I am kind of in that privileged position. I have a, a lot of freedom in my life, like in my day-to-day -day life. So of course I'm viewing things like, well, you know, life really isn't that bad. I don't want to have children. I have no, in, no interest in bringing children in this world. I'm not going to, I've already made that decision. I have two nephews. My, you know, my brother had two kids by accident and I'm a happy aunt and, you know, I encourage them to have happy lives. I hope that they have maybe no children either, <laughs> you know, so I, they, they know why I don't want to have kids and they're not being told that that's the way to live. So, and, and quite honestly, you know, at the beginning of discovering the child-free community, when I discovered the like antinatalism and really the, like when you came on the podcast, that was really the first eye-opening conversation I ever had, because prior to that, my thought towards antinatalism was very much how the child-free 
community is perceived when someone just happens to Google child free or people who don't want to have kids and they come across an angry Reddit post and they go, oh, these people are just angry, bitter people. I mean, I have to admit my, my, my first thought of antinatalism, I, I mean, I can't remember what post I saw, but it was something like that was funny, but really hardcore. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, and, and, you know, speaking with you and, and speaking with other people who are antinatalists and we're just, just having conversation and understanding, it's, it's the same as someone who's not a child-free person, but thinks that we child-free people are just miserable creatures. So it's more to do with a lack of understanding, you know, like I need to, to, to understand more. I honestly don't think, like I joke that I'm a part-time antinatalist because there's a lot of things about it that I totally agree with. And I would honestly push for more people to not have kids because I, I don't think like we, we don't need more people. I mean, I, I enjoy living. I really do. And I want people to have good lives. But again, I live in Canada. I mean, yeah, we have problems, but there are so many people that have life unimaginably worse than I ever will. So it's easy for me to say, oh, people should choose, you know? So it's, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to change that position, but just for me, it's being more aware that there is a lot more suffering out there and it's not necessarily my role to have all those experiences, but be aware of it. And I see, as I understand what antinatalism means and see how people live through it, like it's not, I, I think there should be more aware, awareness of it, you know, because there, there is also there's that thing that people think all child free people are antinatalists. That's not true. I mean, we meet antinatalists who are parents. <laughs> so as I'm sure you do too, right? So I think, you know, I, I don't, you know, I can't say to a, an antinatalist that has kids, well, how come you're not child free? <laughs> you know, because a lot of times it's like, well, I didn't know I had a choice. So I think as to, you know, why we are, or I am one thing or the other, when it comes to something I can choose, you know, it's just more about understanding and see how time progresses. I mean, I don't know, maybe in 10 years, I will real like resonate more with antinatalism and say, you know what? Yeah. Don't have kids. Like really don't have kids. Who's to say? So that's where I'm at currently in my journey. So. And in this journey, have you seen the different categories of antinatalism um, or different thoughts uh, within that uh, sphere? Well, yeah, because, knowing Amanda, I mean, yeah. when Amanda can't like Ethelism, for example, I, mean, I, was, I was just going to say, like, yeah, this that's... is one of the disagreement. Well, not the differences <laughs> of Amanda and I is that, uh, yeah, there's Ethelism, there's antinatalism and within antinatalism, people are more philanthropic. Some are misanthropic right. antinatalists, some are environmental, some are, like I could go on and on. Um, so, yeah. so it really is the same as the child free community. I mean, there are there are child free people who are like, yep. We're selfish. We don't want to do anything for nobody. <laughs> and then there's someone like Kristen who's like, no, don't say that word. I mean, you know, like it's, there's, everyone has a different idea of what that word represents. And I mean, to lump every antinatalist into one way of being, right. to lump all child-free people in. I mean, even if you combine childless and child-free, I mean, oh, this is where we could talk for another 12 hours on what the differences are yeah. but it's just this is where having different viewpoints is so cool because you know I'm curious I, I'm curious just to be a fly on the wall between you Amanda and Mark talking about your differences in wait a sec <laughs> what, yeah. how do you view this right like it's it's really curious and, and that's I think a huge thing that this podcast has tried to kind of unpack and you know all of these all of as a philosophy I mean even though not having kids, whatever you want to call it, has been an idea with man, humankind for millennia, millennia, a long, 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 long time. As identity, as a thing you actually talk about in, in, in polite society uh, or identify as, like, it's all very new. And so and I, I personally feel like it's all still very much evolving. And the lines, you know, it's part of what I want to talk about later is I think some of the lines are getting blurred. And so, yeah, no, fascinating from all three of you. I mean, I, I think there's really, really good thoughts uh, throughout. And there is so much. Um, there's a kernel of an idea that we all can agree on, I think. But everything around that kernel is <laughs> a major disagreements throughout. And I, I find that aspect of it absolutely fascinating. 
So I want to talk a little bit about the podcast in, in, more, in more detail. I mean, was the podcast the first of the projects you girls all came together for? <laughs> it's like you guys want to unmute and use yeah. your words. Yeah. <laughs> Nodding is ineffective. <laughs> this is also audio. She has an audio version, right? For yeah, this? yeah. Not just, okay. Um, so, but yes. Yeah. It, I mean, this is, yeah. I think this is the one collaboration that we have between the three of us. I mean, the thing about Chopper Girls is that we started with the web series and then we, we, we actually have a book. Yeah. Uh, it's on Amazon. <laughs> it's right there. Right over Lenore's shoulder. <laughs> link below, link below. Go buy it. So, uh, we have t-shirts. Shameless plug. Wait, and then the book. And then after the book, we did the, I mean, we turned all our web series into a podcast and now we have merchandise, you know, Kristen's wearing one of our t-shirts today. Um, so it's been, everything has been within Child for Girls, I guess. And it's just evolved. Child for Club on Clubhouse. Oh, and Child for Clubhouse. Yeah, we're the three founders of Child for Club on Clubhouse. Um, and it's been two and a half, two years, a little bit over two years we've been doing collaborating together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's just an incredibly productive collaboration between the three of you. I mean, it's very impressive. I mean, how, how did all of you first find one another and, and have you ever met each other in, in real life? We have, we have not yet met. So I'm in Canada. Kristen is in the U S Connecticut. Isabel's in Columbia. Um, so it was, I, I got emails from both of the girls for different things. Uh, 2019, Kristen, I didn't, we didn't know each other. I think we followed each other on Twitter or somehow we're kind of in the same space, but I got an email from someone named Kristen asking if she could send me her book, The Age of the Child to read because I was just starting to blog about being child free. So I said, sure, that was the first, actually, no, I had received two emails around the same time. One was from this woman. I can't remember who it was anymore. It was like, I have this book. You should go buy it on Amazon and then talk about it on your blog. And then I got this lovely, polite, message saying I've written this book she gave me the synopsis I'll send it to you for free I was like sure <laughs> huge difference I said yes to one and no to the other so I read the book and I loved it and I started emailing her and then Kristen had this idea for my Instagram and I was like well let's make it a collaboration and she's like oh no we don't have to I'm like yes I want it to be a collaboration because I was really enamored always with Elton John and Bernie Taupin's collaboration for their 50 year career. And sh like about a month prior, I just remember thinking it would be so cool to meet somebody and you just vibe and you make something and it lasts for 50 years. No pressure you two, but I, I so, and I was like, I, I never collaborated before. And then, and then I don't know, a few weeks later, I got an email from Isabel who we followed each other on Instagram or something. And she's like, I have a podcast. Would you be a guest on it? It was about, you know, my being child free. So I listened to it and it was new, but I liked her vibe. I was like, oh, I like, like, I didn't really know podcasts, but I liked her voice and I just felt comfortable listening to it. So I agreed to go on. And then we talked for what, like two hours, I think after the, we, we recorded and then we stopped recording and kept on talking. And then I did a blog post about both of them, about their work, the book and the podcast and tagged each other. And there was a four, uh, a, another girl I had talked about as well, who initially was going to join us. There's going to be four of us, but it just ended up being three. Um, so anyway, and then I got a, I'll let Isabel go next, but I got a message from her after I, I wrote the blog talking about Kristen and Isabel's stuff, tag them each in it. And then if, I don't know, a few weeks later, I get this voice memo from Isabel saying, I have this idea <laughs> and then take it away, Isabel. And the idea was that we should collaborate and I wanted Lenora to get in touch with Kristen and the other person to see if they were uh if they wanted to do it and we actually the four of us got together zoom call so I've like Lenora said we've never actually met each other in person um and they both said yes uh a few days later the other girl said you know what I have too much on my plate I can't do this we appreciate we appreciated the the honesty um, and since then, it's been the three of us, you know, just working on on the web series, which Lenora was like, I don't want to appear on camera. <laughs> and Kristen, too. Kristen and Lenora were like, me, camera, YouTube, people can watch this. Um, but it's been it's been such a great, um, I mean, it's been a great journey for us because it's interesting how we all have very similar opinions about some things and 
not at all about other things. So it's just, right. it's interesting to have the three of us talk uh, about subjects that are, you know, related to the chocolate choice. That's what we do. Yeah, well, the, I mean, the podcast is great. I, I think you guys, girls, sorry, cover so much ground within, and I, I love seeing that. I know this is kind of a silly question, but where does the logo come from? Is it a seal? Okay, Kristen, you have to answer that question. <laughs> uh, well, we were just trying to think of something as a logo, and obviously it couldn't be all of our faces because then it would be way too small. Um, and, you know, just the the no entry sign is... Uh, over it's used a lot not it's not over I'm just saying it's used a lot and it wouldn't it doesn't you know speak directly to a specific thing um and in the age of the child there is a character who jumps out of her there's traffic there's a protest happening at an intersection and the protest group is you know carrying signs that are kind of anti-abortion it's you know save the children think of the children um if you can't do the time don't do the crime that kind of thing and this woman wearing a steel mask jumps out of her car, drops a baby at the feet of these protesters, then gets back in the car and goes away. And this is after birth control had been um, criminalized as had abortion. So a lot of people are having babies they don't want. So she left this baby with these people showing such concern for children. Uh, and they shuffled away from the baby, leaving it on the sidewalk. And the, this, I was thinking of this woman when we were thinking of a logo uh, because she wore a gray steel mask because from what I'd read, gray steels will abandon their young. They're not incredibly maternal. Um, and it's not like they'll just take off for no reason, but if there is a threat or something, they'll, they'll, they'll bail and leave their babies behind. So it just seemed like a, an appropriate animal mascot for us. <laughs> Not the answer I ever would have expected, but I love that. I, I love so seals are like the mascot for the child free world, whereas pandas are sometimes the mascot for the antenatal world because they don't want to have kids. That's really, I love Ooh, that. Okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> Not enough people ask us about the animals like the seals. I'm glad you asked that question because for two years, I think we've gotten maybe four, <laughs> four people asking and we're like, we want more attention on that. I didn't know that about pandas though. I had never really sure. noticed the logo for some reason, but yesterday I was looking at it because it's got the new one's got a mask on. So I was like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> so, okay, that, that, that's a great answer. Thank you so much. Um, how do you generally come up with subjects for each podcast episode? What is that process like between the three of you? We just show up and start talking. No. <laughs> yeah, it really depends. Um, so like Fair recently enough. our, our, um, our latest episode coming out is, uh, first of all, it's an interview with, um, can't say her last name, Rockland. but she sang a song. Huh? Rockland. Lily Rockland. Yes. yes, thank you. She sang a song called uh, Child Free. And so we had her on, but in the overall discussion, we talked about something that had showed up in our group chat. Uh, it was a an A- A-I-M-A from Reddit and am I the blank hole? I'm not sure what the language is like on this. But this person asked if they were the jerk. And so we discussed whether they were the jerk. So we'll have conversation, we'll have talks on our episodes that come from just our own conversations or from things people are talking about in Reddit or from things people will say in the comments on our Instagram um, or just what we're seeing out in the world. Like if there's some situation that seems like it's very relevant to the child-free community such as the recent abortion ban and now reversal yay in texas what it's yeah. been reversed it's temporary yeah, what, 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 hey, hang on a second breaking <laughs> news here what what okay i'll go google also people email us questions and sometimes we turn that into a yeah podcast. yeah so okay we'll yeah i've heard those episodes, i have so. to go google that i'll be right back <laughs> Or yeah, or things we say, like, because we have a, you know, Kristen just mentioned that we have a chat. We're, we're in a group chat on Messenger and we talk there 30, 365 days a year. Like we're always connected. We're always like sending each other messages. And sort of that's where we sort of make the decisions about everything. And sometimes we have our, um, you know, the subjects about what we're going to talk about in each episode. We have them thought already and some days we're just like what are we going to talk about tomorrow and then one of us puts any idea out there and then we sort of like say okay and and that's more or less our process it doesn't it's not very scientific 
There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. It's always felt natural, I think, though. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, and that that's back to the the earlier thing about me not wanting to go on screen and Kristen, you know, this isn't necessarily her wheelhouse either. Like she wasn't necessarily interested, but what piqued my interest is the the message and the conversation and the vibe we had when we first met. And it was kind of, I felt like these two will have my back. So as uncomfortable as I have felt, you know, in the initial episodes, I, I, it was, it felt like talking amongst friends. So we could, I could put that aside and the three of us, you know, I mean, really a lot of our great stuff is when we were before the episode and after <laughs> there's, cause when we're just going back and forth, we do have a natural, like we're, we're all different personalities, but when we do come together, it's just like, we can be having the crappiest of days. And then I guess this is my experience. I think it's for their, them too, but we'll get together. And we'll start talking. And it's like, afterwards, I'm just done. Like I'm happy again, because we've had a conversation about whatever we're talking about, but it's also just fun to connect with them. And so that really, people do no notice that, like how it comes across on the podcast. So that, you know, even if we don't have a, a soup with topics, we always pull something off and it's satisfying. So that's, for me, it was a big thing. It was like it, it being sat, like after we hit like stop record, you know, it, it feels good. So that's, I, that's been my experience. I just want to ask good that, too. the, if, like, if you want to watch us in our most improvised way, like the most improvised facets of us is it's, it's the Halloween episodes. Like, we're okay. always like, yeah. we're going to do a Halloween episode about yeah okay whatever we throw it out there and we we don't know how we're gonna show up what we're gonna say it's just it's 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 I I love those episodes because it's just a way for us to sort of like be silly and put everything out there and, and have fun and those yeah. two are hilarious these two like in just an everyday conversation I have no idea how funny they are but then we get on and we do the Halloween <laughs> episode and I'm dying they're just we're recording it tomorrow I'm really curious to see no it's 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 a great, it's a great time. I think that's the, yeah, it's something that maybe the three of us are the, the one, the biggest fans of, but, <laughs> but they're, they're, but, but I mean, that's, that's, you, you can't really plan that. And I'm not talking just about the, the Halloween episode when I think over two years, because I mean, as you know, podcasting isn't easy. This is why people start and stop. I mean, it's, and there's times where it's like, oh my gosh, what are we going to talk about? But there there is a there is a vibe between the three of us and a there's a shared passion for the conversation so an idea always comes up always like somewhere we've we've always we always have an idea for something you know and i i think that's that's coming from somewhere else i mean that's it's inspiration so you know and it's always felt in like inspired i mean we've worked on things that haven't worked but We've been consistent every two weeks since 2019. So that speaks for something, right? Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, there's so many different projects. I mean, the podcast obviously is an incredibly important part of that, but there's the merch now, which I love, which 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 Kristen is sporting today. There's the book, which I, I, I apologize. I have not read yet. I'm going to pick it up today, actually. Um, so I'd love it if you could tell me a little bit about that. But then there's also this massive child free conference, which was extraordinary, just back to back, you know, child free entertainment and education. Um, and then there's everything going on on Clubhouse, which I think is having a, a major impact. Um, so can you I mean, I know that's a lot, but I mean, can you can you guys tell me about just some of these other projects you're working on. Well, it just means I don't have a life. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> That's what it means for me. Nor I, nor I. Um, I can say a little bit about the book because I think one of the things about books and maybe why they're hard to sell is because people think they're filled with lots of words, <laughs> frankly, and nobody has time for lots of words. But Lenora, would you mind? Um, just for the people who are watching, um, we really basically only have one sentence per page, except for the intro. Um, it's just uh, sayings. I mean, it's almost like chicken soup for the soul, but without a whole big story. Like it's, it's not, you know, it's not golden sunshine is falling on your head, inspiration, you know, love yourself, whatever. It's, it's nothing like that. It's really just, uh, and maybe she'll read a couple uh, examples for you, but each page is just one 
little one little thing one little piece of piece of wisdom or 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 uh like some, recipes something too like aphorisms like, but not affirmations sort of. yeah. Sort of, yeah i mean yeah it's like whatever we kind of each page kind of combats whatever someone might have been told or what they might have thought about their child free choice like whether it's mm -hmm. something about whether they feel like they're selfish whether they feel like it'll make them lonely whether they feel like it's the wrong choice there's something on a page that will address that for example page 74 child free is why we can have nice things you know i mean it's <laughs> that that's one of my personal favorites um oh Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's things like that. There's memes, there's recipes. We have a fun quiz. You don't have to shout your child free status from the rooftops to be an example, embrace it and shine it in your own way. So, you know, just it's, it's not, you don't have to sit down and read the whole thing back to front. It's like, if you're having a crappy day, if you had a terrible conversation with your coworker about why you should have 72 children, you know, I, I have, like a belief systems, like you need to, it, it helps to have, um, to feel confident quietly to yourself about being child-free before you're ready to go out into the world and talk about it. So things like a book where you can be in the privacy, maybe you have no one to talk to, you have no one to share your thoughts with, or you're not ready to share your thoughts with somebody. You're not ready to go on clubhouse. You're not ready to kind of like meet other people. This is an example of what you can just like, you know, in your bedroom or when you're taking a bath, you can just kind of like go through the thoughts in your head and you know, okay, well, there's at least three people in the world that don't want to have kids and they can understand how I feel. That's kind of the point of the book. You know, it's just, it's, it's a tool. It's something that you can feel okay about yourself. If you're having a bad day or if you're, or if you're unsure about what, what should I do? Should I have kids? Should I not have kids? Most of us have, have really benefited from reading something or listening to something or seeing something of an example of what it's like to not have kids and then it's okay like it's actually quite great you right, know so right. that's that's the purpose of of the book wonderful yeah well I, i'm looking forward to picking it up i can just speak a little bit about the merch so um cody hetzel and lucas don't remember his last name um Jenny. Jenny. Thank you. um there are two chopper men who are also very visible in the community, they they are start, they start collaborating because they both had like their own Chalfrey merch stores. And then they were like, we should just like collaborate, like do this together. So we're gonna be like stronger. And the idea behind buy Chalfrey, buy Chalfrey. So buy B-U-I Chalfrey, B-U-I Chalfrey um, is to showcase uh, products that are designed by Chalfrey people and for top of people. So they invited us, the three of us, to be part of their store. Um, and we had some designs we submitted that are based on some of our memes that we have. And it's very, it's, it has a very vintage feel, the Child Free Girls collection, if you can see Kristen's, <laughs> Kristen's t-shirt. And you can find, like, you can find the same design in t-shirts, in mugs, in notebooks and there's just a, many different types of um, merchandise but the, the idea behind what they're doing uh, is to sort of not only support the child free entrepreneurs but also people who want to wear or have something with them that reminds them every day that they're child free or that sort of like puts it out there and it can be in a very subtle way or it can be in a very out their way they, they they want people to have like a choice and, and a place where they can buy all those all those things so we're, we're very happy and we just launched maybe like two weeks ago i think it was so you know it's it's one of our oh, wow okay yeah it's one of our younger youngest youngest uh, projects i mean those images have been on like instagram and your social media but yeah it's a that's i mean that's a great natural progression i mean to put them on shirts now i think is a great idea excellent for for people who are listening who can't read this, I can't read it either because I'm mirrored. So could somebody please read this just for just to so people get a sense of the kind of stuff? You can't spend your whole life having fun. Eventually you have to settle down and make a family. Do you actually hear the things you're saying? Or the things you said, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, was, I was close. 
like this, it. it's I think if you a lot of times when you're when you're just out and about in the world, you see so many things that are pro. And I'm not saying pro family is bad. I think if you have a family and you love your family, sure, whatever, enjoy it. Show people you enjoy it. But you really don't see anything that that offers a alternative to that just out in the world in t-shirts, for example, like I cannot wait to wear this to a grocery store. I am so excited. I have another one that says, um, you know, it's all these, it's these bodyguards holding back a bunch of women and it says, stand back ladies, there's a mother coming through. And then these arrows point down to all these women saying what they do, like one's a professor, one's a chef, one's an astronomer, but hey, there's a mom coming, um, which should be read ironically, but I can see now how it'll be misinterpreted as if it's glorifying motherhood. I should have thought about that more, but anyway, I'll just have to explain it's ironic. But I think wearing these things and the the words are big enough, I think, that someone could actually see them if you're standing in line. Uh, but it's also fun for like a work mug or whatever. It's just just to have it out there, just kind of floating around very subtly in the consciousness, kind of like subliminal advertising. Like, hey, we had a conference. <laughs> That that actually was not a we we spoke as a panel on that conference. I'm one of the co-founders. That's a, a a collaboration with two other people. Um, but we collaborated on Child Free Club uh, or created Child Free Club on Clubhouse when that came about February. I think Isabel was well. Isabel's and I I had heard about Clubhouse and I was desperate to get on. And Chris or Isabel had an invite, and I was like, yes, please, please, please. And so her and I, you know, uh you had to do some enough speaking on clubhouse to get a club. So Isabel was like going hardcore, trying to get enough credits to build, to get us to be able to get a club going for child free people. We couldn't convince Kristen for the longest time. And I was just, I mean, I'm a talker. So clubhouse is right up my alley. And so we eventually were able to get Kristen on. She agreed when she realized how fun it was <laughs> to join the app. And we were able to create child free club. And then I thought, well, one day I'll wake up in the morning and host a morning show just to see if anyone shows up. And it's been going on every Monday through Friday since March. Like the day, the time change, the day, the weekend of the time change, I started that. So I get up now at eight o'clock every, every day during the week and have conversations. It's been amazing. I love it. It's It's been great. And we have rooms on Saturdays. We have rooms on Sundays. And it's been just... I, I, I never connected with social media the way I have with Clubhouse just because it's audio and I, I do, I mean, talking is my thing. I love to do it, but it's just holding space for people to share whatever they need to share in the child-free space. And, you know, I'm not a morning person and I love waking up to do it. And even when I, I was um, out with the broken ankle, I mean, the crew took over and were able to mod it for me. And it's been really cool to develop a community there as well. Um, and that has been, I mean, we've, we've had meetings on it, you know, the three of us, and it's just, it's just been a cool way to connect with people, you know, who don't, cause not everybody listens to podcasts Not everybody like there, we laugh because, you know, we have a substantial Instagram account and probably three quarters of them have no idea that we're a podcast, even though we keep saying we're a podcast, but then there's people who listen to us who will never find us on social media. And then there are some people that, that consume everything we do. So you know, I mean, it's putting, we don't put our eggs in. I mean, the, the bulk of it will always be the podcast web series. That's what, that's our thing. That's what brought us together. That's, I mean, that's the core of it, you know, and social media has been, you know, has taken off well enough and we've had other opportunities and there's, there's more things that we're working on that we don't talk about yet. Cause we're not ready to talk about them, but I mean, it's, we've proven that we can work together. So when there's yeah. an, not everything works out as far as like, there's things we've tried and you know, that that's standard. Nothing is always going to be a hit, but it's really cool to know that there's a growth potential. Can I throw that word out there? I mean, there's so much, we, there's many opportunities that can, ex, that can happen between now and you know, what, 48 more years. I'm, I'm going for that, <laughs> that long-term Elton John, Bernie Taupin collaboration, you know, I'm um, just putting it out there. But I mean, we, we know how we work, right? And we cover each other when we're, one of us is having a crisis or whatever. I mean, there's that, there's that connection, which is, which is important. So, you know, it's, it's like, as Isabel said, oh, things have evolved over, you know, we, the podcast web series, that's the core. 
things have evolved since we started personally for us as a group, you know, it's, it's, so it's really cool. And you know, that's, yeah, <laughs> there's, there's a lot more to come. Who knows what it will be, but we're, we're here. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, I, 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 can you talk a little bit about the child free conference and, you know, some of the international communities that you were able to connect, um, through because of that? Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I'll, 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 I always say like all the cool stuff I've gotten to do has happened because of these two girls <laughs> and our podcast. Cause for example, the guy that had the idea, Jared came on our, uh, came on our show as a guest. He's like, I have this Facebook group and you know, he wanted to talk about it. And then he had this idea and he had emailed us. And then somehow I got roped into doing the logo, which I didn't know I could do logos, but I created a really kick ass logo. We've since rebranded to call it's now child, called child for convention. But for this year, we were the 2021 virtual child for conference. So that was actually a, a nine hour live stream event. And we had over 30 international speakers, child for people. We had 15 topic panels. Um, and here's the thing. Everything leads to another, like we had child for girls. We did a panel called, you know, child for collaborations. We talked about why it's important. It gave us a platform to, because there's a lot of, there's the competition in everything, right? You know, so being able to get together and, and show that, hey, like we all came into Child for Girls with our own individual brands, but we combine our resources, our talents, our abilities together and have created Child for Girls. We wanted to showcase to other people, don't be afraid of working with other child free people. Like you, it's not going to take away from what you're doing. It can actually enhance because, because I said yes to doing this podcast, I got the opportunity to be a co-founder of this conference, which has now turned into a convention, but we have sponsorship for it. So we actually did get sponsored by StreamYard. They've now sponsored us for an entire year meeting. We have full high definition for a full year. So we're doing other events with it. I mean, it's, it's just led to another collaboration and, you know, and, and people that we were able to reach out to because I met from doing the podcast It all, it, it, it all, it all blended nicely together. Right. I mean, it's a whole other, like I said, I have no life because we've already started next year's because we have to, there's a lot to do. Yeah. Um, but as far, and, and here's the thing. So because of child free girls, we had child free club. I was meeting people from Pakistan, from India, from Kenya, you know, I was able to not, I meaning the conference, we were able to bring these voices to showcase and not, and, and not just female, because it tends to be very female centric. Like right. I work with everybody. Well, not everybody, but you know, I no, I'm not just going to focus with like women. I'll work with men or non-binary, whoever, because it seems to be very female driven. And I'm, I'm not about that anymore. I'm like, let's bring everybody together. So the conference was a great way to showcase, you know, different genders, different. It, it's not just white driven. It's, you know, as we try to get as many people involved as possible. And that just gave us the platform for next year because looking around, it's usually the similar faces, similar points of view. We're child, child free club has proven. I mean, they're, they're, I'll say this as someone who's half black, half white, there are very few white people that show up to child free club <laughs> because it's a space where we can talk about race and sexuality and all the things that make people uncomfortable. We do that on our podcast. We don't just come. Cause I mean, look, we're Kristen's white. Isabel's Latina. I am biracial. I'm also queer. One's married, one's dating, one's doing whatever the fuck she wants. Like we come, we're, we're not just one point of view. We're very diverse between the three of us, Our different lifestyles, everything. So it has allowed us to reach a wide range of people and, you know, create spaces for those people who are often not heard in traditional child-free spaces to say something. And part of that we saw that at the conference because there was a lot there it wasn't the usual suspects speaking it was a bunch of people that no one's ever seen before and that will continue we're not bringing the same people we're not again because you know like in every organization there tends to be a bit of a, a hierarchy or you know so and so has been doing this forever and blah, blah blah right but it's a new it's a new day there's so many voices in so many different countries that are like, we have someone from Lebanon started coming into child for morning chat. Who's like, 
I don't have anyone to talk to. So she's, you know, now thinking of how to reach other people in her area. And like, it's stuff like that because they're, we're all talking and yeah, a lot of us are from North America, but it's to listen to other perspectives. Not all child-free people live the same life. For some of us, it's easy to be free about it. Some people like people in India, they got to be secretive about it and just meet quietly online. Right. So, I mean, it's, things are really opening up and, and the, the conference was a way, like we saw it, like we didn't expect it to go that, like that diverse so quickly and it happened. And, and because of that, it's really opened up a lot of new doors. I can't say what's happening for next year, but it's really cool, but it's, it's really focused on bringing the voices that you rarely hear from. So this is why I don't have a life is because I'm very passionate about this subject, <laughs> not having kids. And it's been really cool to meet the people that I've met and collaborate and have these opportunities that I never imagined, but are, I can't imagine not doing them because it's just so perfect. Like there's nothing else I need to do in life. Really? I mean, I still want to have another music career, but there's nothing else I really need to do. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, for what it's worth, I feel exactly the same way. I mean, I know we're coming at this from a, two different parts of the anti-procreative world, but, you know, this is like one of the most important things in my life and it's brought me so to so many things. And so I, I have the same level of, of uh, passion, you know, that I think that you're expressing now. So I completely identify is what I'm trying to say with, with what you're saying. And, and yeah, I mean, it, you know, the anti-natalist community as well is so remarkably diverse and that's only increasing. And so it's, I love what you've done to harness that. And I think that it's so, it's within the child-free world. I think that that's so important. Um, when you were planning the child-free conference, was there any open conversation about keeping things just child-free and not addressing antinatalism? Was there any discussion at, at any point on extending the event to include some antinatalism? You'll have to watch for next year. <laughs> um, I like that answer. Okay. So <laughs> I, I, came, I came into the conference last, like there was, Jared, who had the idea, who contacted Cody, who does child free, buy child free, buy child free. And then they were looking for help. And I was one person who said, sure, I can help. I can make a logo. And then somehow I got in as PR manager and then a co-founder and then not took over, but took over. <laughs> like, I mean, then, then we really, we really expanded because Cody and I had a bigger vision for what the initial idea was. So yes, there was that conversation and that is something that now we are in a position to incorporate. Again, that's all I can really say about it. Um, because we made, we made the conscious decision to really make it from a child free by choice perspective, because that's the thing that's really lacking. There are childless summits. There are people, you know, there there's, they say it's child free, whatever, but it's usually coming from a place of, you know, uh, infertility or there's, there's lots of support for that, but we wanted to focus on a really positive celebratory we chose not to have children. We're pro-choice perspective. And so we, we narrowed it down to the people who submitted applications because the guys had just put out like a blanket. Who wants to talk without really structuring it? And then from there, we, we, we figured out what kind of panels we could do have with who submitted an application. So that's really, it was kind of like, let's just make this idea happen somehow is how it ended up being. So we didn't have anyone that came forward that said, this is what I really want to talk about. And because we don't, you know, personally, and I think I'm okay to say this, is that we, we didn't, when it comes to antinatalism, we, we wanted, you know, it was, it's the same as with climate change panel and certain topics that need a little bit of expertise behind them. We just didn't want a bunch of people saying, oh, I'm an antinatalist and this is blah, blah, blah. We sure. want someone who can speak to what antinatalism is. We didn't have anybody that fit that bill. Therefore, you know, because you have to remember, like, you know, when you first put out an idea, you're kind of flying by the seat of your pants and you, it's kind of make or break. Either this was going to be a complete disaster or it was going to work. Luckily it worked, but we were careful that we didn't just bring in random opinions with nothing to back it up because I, I, I respect the antinatalist community and the conversation enough to want to have like some meat behind, uh, behind the conversation, not just a bunch, a bunch of people saying, I hate humanity. No one should procreate. Right. 
because and and so that was if we had somebody come forward and say i can do this presentation absolutely you know which luckily we have a second year coming up <laughs> um because it it the thing is we heard when, once the conference was announced once the speakers and the panels were released then we heard from so many people like oh you should do you know like and 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 then and then we pulled it off and then we heard from even more people we're like next you know so it's we have options now that's amazing right? yeah absolutely yeah it's 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 this is why we've we've already started like we took august off and then september we were back at it <laughs> working for next year because it's you know incredible. it's it's proven that it, it's it's needed and now we have something to show for it so the conversations i mean how you know i mean it really could span a week <laughs> so lenora i just speaking to the impact as i as i was saying you know that you've had you know on child free and anti-natalist but with what you're doing with uh with clubhouse um so i don't know if you know who arif raza is but every year i do um something called the why are you an anti-natalist contest where people make entries and they have the chance to win prizes and so last year's winner uh connor garcia who's an author he wrote a book called La uh, last call for heroes he made these uh two extraordinary handcrafted steel bookends of the logo of this very podcast and he was the winner of the new antinatalist division of this year's contest. Uh, now he lives in India. And when I was talking to him about sending him, these things are very, very heavy. Um, he had sort of an extraordinary request, which was to give them to you, um, to reward you for the fact that you, you do this every day. <laughs> you're on Clubhouse talking to people. You're so open, you're giving, you know, so I'm just putting one down because I have a bad hand and it's so heavy. <laughs> but I mean, because you're, you're creating this space for people, you know, all over the world to talk about these subjects, whether they're antinatalists or child-free. So if you want them, <laughs> um, they're yours yeah. and I will be sending them to you. So I'll talk to you, I'll email you uh, after uh, in a little oh, while later so today. Cool. So I just wanted to let you know, yeah. You're, that you're, was you're, Arif? That's he Arif, said, yeah. Oh, he's a sweetie. Yeah, he is he, a sweetheart, uh, yeah. Yes, I have to, he, he sent me a short story and yeah. I have a queue of things to read. I, I have to read that now. That yeah. is so sweet. Yeah, so <laughs> I'll take him to, totally. Wonderful, uh -huh. wonderful. Well, listen, I just, I want to, I think all three of you are extraordinary. I think what you're doing is incredible. I, I so, uh, I'm so um, inspired by the passion that all three of you have for this subject and everything that you're doing and just the, you know, the production and the, the, the entrepreneurship that you're offering to it. I want to apologize so much for having to leave a bit early, but uh, I leave you in Mark's very, very capable hands. And Mark, I'll be in touch later. Just thank you so much to all four of you. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. This has been awesome. Yeah, this has been awesome nice to, to talk chat. to you. So much chat. Love talking to you. Yeah, I love talking to you too. It's lovely to see all three of you again. Um, I'll, I'll be in touch later. Take good care, everybody. One thing that I want to find out, um, I believe, Isabel, on the website, you said you're a child-free intersectional feminist, yeah? Could you expand on that a little bit more? Well, you know, I think intersectionality in feminism is very important. Like, I personally think that because when I first started discovering fem feminism, um, I realized how skewed the view was and how white and privileged it was. Um, and it's interesting because I, I read something the other day that made me think about, um, about this specific subject. And it's, it says something that said something, I mean, loosely, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here because I don't remember exactly what it said, but it's um, white feminists want women to be like men in developed capitalist countries, whereas there's so much more to feminism because not all women are in the same position, basically. So intersectionality came into my, I started reading about feminism and I, I heard about intersectionality maybe five years ago, I think. And it's the idea that feminism I mean, when you talk about feminism, you need to also not only look into the fact that their gender is, you know, of course, female, um, but also to think about every other thing that can impact their life and their opportunities and what it is that they need as, as women. So I'm talking about race, I'm talking about uh, origin as in country, 
I'm talking about uh, education. There's just so many things that come into play because you can't talk, I mean, for intersectional feminists like myself, we can't think about just like a general feminist idea that would cover every single woman in the world and give every single woman uh, sort of like their place in the world to put it in a way, right? Um, it's, it's, it has to look at, at people from also all the other sort of point of views and all the other uh, factors that contribute to the fact that they're being oppressed. Um, because, you know, feminism is about oppression. I mean, it's, it's to combat <laughs> patriarchal oppression in the end. Uh, but there's just so much more than that. Um, also, you know, now, for example, it's also very important to talk about, you know, since we've had this conversation worldwide about gender and it's been getting even more popular now, um, you know, for example, trans women are also part of the group of, of women who need to be uh, who need feminism in a different way um, than you know cis women do. So it's it's about sort of taking in all these factors and 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 trying to uh, understand that not every action for feminism is going to impact all women around the world in the same way. Lenora and Kristen, do you also um, identify with that type of intersectional approach to uh, to feminism? I honestly have always just thought of I mean I completely agree with it obviously um there's no yeah I mean I don't I don't identify myself really as anything like I don't identify as this or as that I don't even identify as child free I just am um so that's but yes I agree that feminism should be intersectional I agree that there's way more to think about than um then white women want to be paid as much as high paid white men. I mean, obviously that's, I think any, anything that, that results in the discrimination of oppression of or um, systemic abuse of uh, any person who doesn't identify as male, uh, whatever color, whatever geographic, you know, origin, yes, that should be I completely agree in, in that, with that, yes. I've never quite understood what feminism means. And I'm like, well, I'm just a walking intersection myself. So like, I, how do I, what, what, you know, like I'm, yes, female, I identify as a female, I'm queer, I'm biracial. Half the stuff of what feminism talks about, I also don't wanna have kids. I chose not to be married, I like to live alone. God, there's so many things to pull from. I, I still don't know if I'm sure I'm a feminist, but then if I read a description of what some feminist groups do, I'm like, well, meh, no, because I don't want to bash anybody. You know, it, it's, it's, I've never gotten a complete handle on what being a feminist is. When I started, you know, uh, getting to know Isabel and what her work is, and, and Isabel has sent me graphics to kind of explain different things um really on paper yes I would have to say like intersectionality I mean I, I I can't there's no other option but yes for that one um and the more I'm aware of it it, it does even if it doesn't help me describe something or, or describe me it it makes me it has like learning about intersectional feminism not that I'm an expert by any means but from what I know it has made me pay attention to who says that they are a feminist or who says they are an intersectional feminist, just because now I'm a little more aware of what that means. And so I, I just look, you know, just kind of like observe and see, okay, how they, how they speak, what they do, who they are, you know, how they present themselves. Um, because, you know, we've, how, how much of performative posting have we seen on social media? Let's say from like Black Lives Matter till now, um, whether it's well-known companies or people that are creating themselves, like creating their brands around, yes, we're very inclusive. Yes, we are this, yes, we are that. And who's running it and services they offer and who they say that their audience is for. And I, it's, it's curious because if anything, learning about intersectional feminism, not, not really for myself, but just to be aware of 
who is saying that they that they are open-minded and diverse and what have you like it's just it makes me look like what does their company other- actually look like yeah exactly like it's, <laughs> it's really if i'm if i'm paying attention to that conversation it's not really about me and how i identify it's making me aware of who's saying that they are for that because now i know what to kind of know what to look for mm-hmm. you know so okay. uh that probably doesn't answer your question but it, it's just it's just good to know what that even means again not for me personally but just so that i'm not it's hard to take people at face value now especially when it comes to social media because yeah. people say a lot of things they do they, they post all the right things they use all the right words but it's a big but <laughs> you know what i mean thank you uh kristen um I think we're at time now and I just want to thank you for coming on the podcast and um, yeah, it's been great talking to you and we'll, uh, we'll continue uh, with some more questions if uh, the other two don't mind. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Nice to see you, Chris, and we'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. Bye. 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 <laughs> um, I guess my last, my last question is to, for you is um, riffing off of, the child-free intersexual feminism is also what I've observed um, with child the child-free movement is that it challenges gender norms and gender roles for women. And I think that there's, there's quite a, um, there's, there's definitely uh, an intersection of in terms of uh, liberating uh, or empowering women uh, through the child-free movement. Um, though I'm not, again, I'm not uh, too well-versed in the child-free movement, but is that something that uh, you've witnessed as well? Absolutely. Uh, you know, because women, so there's this thing um, that it's sort of like in the collective consciousness of everyone or almost everyone around the world. And it's that womanhood equals motherhood, right? So if you're a woman, then you're supposed to be a mom, you're supposed to become a mother, you're supposed to parent. Um, and there are some people who have been told, some tougher for people, tougher for women, who have been told that because they're not mothers, they're less of a woman, so less of a woman. What does that even mean? Um, so the thing about being child free or being a woman and not wanting kids, like consciously making the choice of not having children, is that you are challenging not only the motherhood part, you're also challenging everything that comes with it, you know, like uh, the role of women at home, uh, because, you know, normally mothers are caretakers and they're gonna be um, a lot more invested in their children's lives. And they're usually the ones that take care of the home and make it all pretty and nice. And the the husband's the, the breadwinner, right? So if you don't have children, women don't have to adhere themselves to those stereotypes either. We're sort of challenging everything about womanhood. We don't wanna be mothers. We don't, I mean, some of us don't wanna stay at home. I would say most of us don't wanna stay at home taking care of, of what? My plants, my cats, my dogs, <laughs> my husband, you know? Um, we wanna do things, we, we have more time, we have more resources, we have more energy to travel the world, to build a career, to, uh, meet people to do, uh, you know, community work, uh, social projects. There's just so much that we can do with all the resources that other women spend on their children. Uh, and, and that challenge, like I said, that challenges all the, like the, the female, the typical stereotypical female roles, basically. And it is very empowering as long as women who are child-free are also accepting uh, accepting of their choice because i've met many tougher women who are who feel extremely guilty and even they feel the weight of their decision in a very negative way so it's 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 for them it's more like how can i not want children what is wrong with me instead of just sort of like embracing and accepting it um, which is what I wish for every, every child for a woman in the world, basically. 
So after you've gone through this process of acceptance, and for some women is a lot easier than it is for others, it becomes very empowering because it's a decision that you've made for yourself. You're not making this decision for anybody else. Nobody's making this decision for you. You're doing it for yourself because nobody else is going to live your life. You're the only one who's going to be able to, who's going to have to live with the repercussions of having or not having children. Nobody else is going to be affected by it. So it is very empowering. It is very reaffirming as well um, of the fact that you have control over your life. Sometimes you feel like you don't, you know, especially as a woman, sometimes you feel like you don't because you have all these boxes that you need to tick. You need to go to school, you need to get married, you need to have children and all this by the time you're 30, the, you know, the house, the white picket fence, the dog and the, the whole shebang basically. And it's, it's, it's reaffirming to the fact that you don't have to take those boxes if you don't want to, and it's totally okay. So it is, um, it's quite interesting to see, you know, child-free women sort of uh, just own it and, and really celebrate themselves and celebrate the other women in our community for the choices that we've made. Great, thank you. So you said like it was about five years ago that you started reading material on this? I started reading material on intersectional feminism. Mm-hmm. I was I was I was curious uh, who are the thinkers and writers that uh, influenced you, and who would you recommend? Well, there is a specific book that I love. It's called Women Anatomy. What is it called? Anatomy of Women. I I don't really like. I'm really bad at remembering books. Okay. <laughs> titles <laughs> really bad. <laughs> But, you know, regarding intersectional feminism, um, there is the person who coined the expression. Crenshaw. It's Crenshaw, yes. Yeah. She, um, she, I've read some things that Kimberly Crenshaw has written. And that's, uh, it's always very eye-opening, uh, you know, especially, you know, Kimberly Crenshaw, she's she's a black woman. And, and it's really, um, there's a lot about what she writes that is just like you're like I can't believe I had not even like seen this before you know what I mean like I haven't actually like uh how do you say it like not experienced it but sort of like realize that this is something that happens this is something this this is a thing right this is a thing um so it's quite interesting um I read a lot of I I like to read like academic papers a lot uh, there's many of those. Uh, if you go to like academic, I think it's academic Google. There's a, there's search engines that are specialized in academic papers that you can read. I like reading those um, more than I do like reading books. Okay. Yeah. That said, there are a lot of books about being child-free that also touch on the subject of, fem- of feminism, of course. So, you know, like Baby Matrix by Laura Carroll or Child-Free by Choice by... Um, Dr. Amy White, what's the last time, last name is of Amy? I always Blackstone. Heard. Blackstone. 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 Um, the Baby Trap by Ellen um, Peck. Thank you. I'm so bad at names. <laughs> this is my, my thing. name. My, my name is Lenora. You're Isabella, and we have the Child Free Girls podcast. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so the last one that I read, um, it's the well, the one that I told you that it's called Women and Anatomy. I just want to find the name because that's a really good book. And the reason I read that book, because this, this is a, an interesting story. Uh, you know, as as it happens in antinatalism and as it happens in child free, in just sort of like the child free community, um, the feminism has a lot of currents. So feminism has a lot of um yeah like different sort of like streams of thought right and there's one called i think it's evolutionary feminism which basically says that men are the way they are because of biology because of like human evolution sort of in a way i'm just like over i'm really oversimplifying this okay um so basically what it says is because men have been you know, for hundreds of years acted in a way what women need to do, like feminism, feminists need to do is also understand the poor 
things because men are over, you know, they're controlled by biology. They're controlled by their, uh, by all this remnant of our, of our, you know, forefathers and everything that they were taught on how to treat women and, how, and what to do around the house or whatnot. Um, and I heard about this from a guy that I dated once, like we had a date and he was like, well, but have you heard about the thing, the biology, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, what is he even talking about? And then I found out that there's this thing called you know, evolutionary feminism. And I was very angry when I read this because I thought it's not, I mean, if we think about it logically, what is it? What is biological nowadays with all the information that we have, with everything that we know, what is biologically, how is it biologically sound for a man to rape a woman, for example? How is it normal, quote unquote normal, uh, to abuse women, to, to live them at home and relegate them and not give them their place in society? What, what is biological about that? So um, I started having a conversation with um, Therese Schechter. She is a, a filmmaker and she actually just released her documentary called My So-Called Selfish Life. So I'm here like plugging that in as well. Um, and it is a documentary about the childhood choice. So I was having a conversation with Therese about it and she was the one who recommended this book, um, which I have in my, library and it's very interesting because what this person does in the book is sort of like she gives all the arguments to why uh that type of feminism is not like it makes no sense basically we can't tell that you know you can't say biology is the reason why men act the way they do and to sort of like in a way say oh poor things let's just understand them we need to be understanding of men because they're overcome with all these feelings of you know, this is just uh, instinct. Um, so yeah, that's a really good book. Thank you for the recommendations. And thank you again for your time and for coming on the podcast. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And we're down oh, to <laughs> one. <laughs> All right, you can go now, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I don't have to stay till midnight by any means, but th this, I, I mean, this has been really, really cool. I mean, just to, we don't, get to it's not about being interviewed but just the conversation this is really really up and awesome mm -hmm. the three of us have enjoyed that i can definitely speak on behalf of the other two as well so so lenora i want to expand a little bit more on the experience and uh, of the of the conference that you had um you said there was a climate uh section right Yes, we had a climate change panel. It was actually done by a someone who's a climate change presenter. So this was for the the majority of the conference was like panels of people having a discussion. This was one of the two um, segments where it was actually a, a presentation done with a speaker and slideshow. Um, so it was done by Ronnie Dam, who is a climate change presenter. Like she's you know um, hobnob with Al Gore and his been very vocal and active in giving these types of presentations regularly so um yeah that actually kicked off the conference so it was very eye-opening <laughs> to say the least and in a good way was there like um lifestyle uh talks as well you mean the talking about the topic panels or with or just talking yeah, the, about the, the, the climate change panel specifically no, in terms of like all the the speakers and the guests and uh, um, like if you were to categorize the different sections that you had, uh, climate change, lifestyle, branding, like how would you how would you um, organize that? It was very much lifestyle, you know, with again, like I came in, I was the last person to join the what became the co-founders and you know, from the original idea of, you know, Jared had a, a thought, you know, an idea of having a conference. It was more of like a impromptu gathering, which turned into like an eight month planning of a, a full on event. What we, as we were discussing, like what kind of things we want, we should be putting together for topics. We generally went with the most common things that are discussed in you know, private child-free groups. So talking about being child-free and single, being married, 
you know, it was, it was very much about lifestyle and we didn't want it to be about, you know, bringing on a ton of experts who are just going to lecture people. We, like I said, we did have people like Laura Carroll, who is, you know, leading expert on the subject. She wrote the baby matrix. She did a solo, solo, well, her and Cody had a, a discussion about the history of international child free day. Um, and then of course we had Ronnie Dam doing the, the climate change panel, but overall it was about people's personal experiences, gathering a panel together of people, you know, from different parts who had different experiences on that one topic. Um, let's say the child free guys talk, because how many times do you get child free men speaking up very rarely? So for example, there was five plus co four or five people including uh, plus Cody, the moderator, they were talking about their experiences as child free men. Um, so it was very much lifestyle based, you know, talking about being sterilized, uh, talking about travel, talking about um, being child free and over over 50 and things like and we did have a child free by circumstance and happy panel, which was for people like there was two women who, who shared their journey from wanting to have children, thinking they would have children to making choices to not have kids and how they really embrace that. So it was the whole point is like real everyday people coming together to share their experiences of living a happy and fulfilled child-free existence to, and then talking about something specific and it was conversation between the moderator and the and the panelists and you know um from the one that i like i moderated half of it but the panel that i was speaking on with Kristen and isabel you know we did talk about collaborating because that's it's, it's not a topic that people really think about, but as more child, more content creators, you know, enter the conversation, it's very relevant because there's a lot of competition as there is with anything. And then we did have like a child free media panel where it was people who create content for child, the child free community about the child free experience in print, film, podcasting, that type of thing. So, you know, we really wanted it to be everyday people that many could relate to. And also we were able to have cultural elements in there as well. For the first year, again, it, it was like, who, who were we getting to speak? <laughs> and what could we center around the people? It was very, you know, we just pull, with, pull from who we had. And we had a lot of people, a lot of people apply, but we really did want to narrow it down to a positive, happy child-free life experience at the end of the day. And we had zero trolls. Can you believe that? No That's trolls whatsoever. That's Not awesome. like we had a, a, the live chat was going like crazy the whole time. And then we had a halftime show, which was pre-recorded. And then uh, me, Cody and Jared came on live, you know, beginning, middle and end. No trolls. We still don't have troll comments. Maybe after, <laughs> I don't know, maybe some people who you guys encounter here, will go over and troll the conference after seeing this. I don't know, but for the, the live event, not an issue. That's it was great. incredible. Incredible. Yeah. Are you familiar with the voluntary human extinction movement? Mm, not, not really. I know of it, but that's, well, about that's it. what I mean. Like, yeah. yeah like, I'm, have I'm, have I'm, you heard of it? Yeah, I have heard of it. Yes. Okay. And you've, you've interviewed Amanda about ephelism, correct? Yes. Right? Yes. And you've uh, sort of, um, uh, seen some aspects of the antinatalism community and their particular views. So you've seen the different threads within this, I don't even know what to call it exactly, the anti-procreative world. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about, or how do you feel and what do you think about this, um, this umbrella of, of all these different thoughts uh, and, and ideologies and um, collaborating, uh, working together, networking, like, is, is this, do you see some pros and cons to this? Uh, how do you, you know, what are your general thoughts on that? I see mostly pros. I, cause I'm like that with about everything, but honestly, even if it's talking about something I don't agree with, let's say like voluntary extinction or whatnot, not that I don't hundred, I don't hundred percent agree with it, but I can appreciate it. It's, it's the conversation that's making people think. You know, and that's what I want to see. And, you know, this is why, this is why, for example, I don't just want to collaborate or work on projects that are exclusively to child-free women. I want to hear all perspectives. 
I want to have the men, the non-binary, whatever gender, like I, I want to hear from antenatalists, from ethicists, from people who can't have kids, who desperately wanted them to, you know, people that love not having children and didn't ever want to have them because as varied and as the, the perspectives are, the whole point is it is it gives a whole new set of a way of thinking compared to what's mainstream, right? So I look at all of this, regardless of where the lens is coming from, it's all, it's all bringing focus, like it's all on a different focus from pronatalism, which is, that's half the battle for me. As I want, and even if people go, what the heck are you talking about? It's still making them think, or at least making them aware there's another way of thinking, even if they write it off as insane, because it'll, it'll still worm its way into their thinking somewhere. <laughs> Cause maybe like five years from now, they'll meet someone who's an antinatalist and they'll go, oh, that's what those weird people were talking about. Not to call you guys weird, but they say the same thing about child-free people, you know, like I think all of it. All, like talking in the big scope, all of it, all of it ser serves a purpose. And there was something that some uh, that was said in one of the uh, morning chat rooms a while ago. It was a, a gentleman from Pakistan talking to another gentleman from India. And they told us in the room that they were both taught to hate each other because they were from different countries. And they both said how neat it was for them to be able to talk to each other in that particular room. And having joined rooms talking about antinatalism as a child-free pro-choice person, that's how I feel. Like it's nice to have conversations with people who subscribe to, you know, that that aren't, you know, they don't identify as child-free, but they're antinatalism or ethalism or whatever, like whatever we're talking about, they're the more I can put a face and an understanding to that thought, um, I don't even know how to use the right what, what the right word is for that, but to that idea. Or that philosophy, like your, the belief system, my understanding grows. And if we can have these conversations from different perspectives, we don't have to change each other's minds or completely agree. But there's just that that I think that level of respect goes up. And then you know we all gather together on this podcast and have a really cool conversation, and we come away learning a little bit more than we did an hour ago, right? So I, I see it all has great value instead of the antinatalists looking at the child for people like you guys are, <laughs> you need to come over to our side or we're trying to go, no, you need to be a little more pro-choice about the whole matter. You know, instead of that, it's like, how can we, you know, bring this conversation more mainstream or to more ears? Because there's a lot of like our audience totally benefited from listening to Amanda. It helped us listening to her, you know? So it's, it, there, there is, we can, we can, we can all work together <laughs> without being too cheesy. It's, it's totally, I think it's great. I love it. You know, I want to see more of it. Again, I'm a huge fan of collaborating. What are some potential cons that you can see? I feel that you know, if someone's just entering like at the beginning of the, their journey, you know, there, there is a lot of anger and I'll, I'll speak specifically from the child-free perspective, because I, I don't want to speak for anyone else. Who's not like for, for an antinatalist or what, what have you. Um, you know, I, I think of the younger, younger people I've met who are child-free, who are realizing they have a choice. And, and I felt this way too, at 25, there's a lot of anger because you've been, you know, it's kind of like angry frustration because people are coming at you. Oh, you'll change your mind. And you don't necessarily have the words and the, you don't necessarily have a community yet to back you up on how you think. So it's kind of like you're, you're fighting <laughs> all the time. And so, you know, I've seen it where people discovered groups. And again, specifically speaking about childhood people, they find a group on Facebook and then they just rant and they just like, throw everything they can at parents and kids and this is not everybody but this is common because you just got all this pent-up anger so i think when when you're at the beginning of your journey discovering how you feel but there's so much that you want to say to all the pushback you've been getting for your life choices i see that you know anger in in communities and, and it feels good to get power in numbers and you're all angry. And then, <laughs> and then someone says something who's maybe a little bit further along on their journey where 
you know, there's the term breeder pleaser. So for me, I don't want to start an argument with parents. I want to have conversations with parents. I'm not, I don't, nothing we do as- Wait, wait, sorry. Podcast, I, I've, I've never actually heard that term before. What is breeder pleaser? Breeder, breeder pleaser is what people would maybe call me, Kristen and Isabel, because we have parents on our show. We are not people that will bash parents or children. And all of our spaces, we make it very clear. We will not tolerate language that is derogatory towards parents or kids. And we invite conversations with parents, people who are, there are certain people that would call us breeder pleasers because we're doing it to make parents happy. Like we're agreeing with them or whatever. It's called being, so that they throw the term breeder pleaser. So an angry person who, let's say at the beginning of their child-free journey, who's like, just needs to get it all out. will look at somebody say like myself, who likes to have conversations with parents about you know, how do they teach their kids that child free is an option? They would say, oh, you're such a breeder pleaser. I want nothing to do with your brand. I've had people say that, like unfollow me and everything because we won't tolerate derogatory language towards kids or parents. Wow. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's, that would be a, an example of a con. Um, also, sometimes when you get so many people together, <laughs> you know, people, words are going to fly. Um, and also I think another thing is if, uh, it depends on what your vision is, your overall vision is, you know, if people, if, if you don't have the same vision, like one thing that works really well with the three of us working on the podcast is that we have, we rarely have conflict. And it, if we do, it's very easy to overcome because we still, we share that same vision for what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And that comes first of everything else. Right. So if not enough people have that understanding, then of course you get a whole bunch of people together. You have the United States, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like too many opposing views. So it's, there's that, but honestly, I see, I see it mostly positive, but then what, I choose to. So what do you, um, your vision and your particular goals and uh, your co-hosts as well, like, what are those goals? What, where, where is this going? And what's the grand picture look like? A special on Netflix. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> that's my personal goal. Not that that's just one of them. I mean, it's again, to bring awareness that it's a choice that having kids is a choice, like, because we're coming again from the, the child free by choice per, or from the pro choice perspective. Um, it's to, to just get the message out in a broader way to not just the child for community, but to the, you know, to the world, to the people that make decisions and to the people that, you know, are in the writer's rooms of, of TV shows and movies, like, hello, child-free people exist. We want to see characters that represent our life choice where you're not suddenly writing in a baby last minute for a series finale or, you're not making the child-free person miserable because, oh, I didn't have kids, but everything I do is meaningless. You know, like it's just to, and also just to provide some content that has nothing to do with parenthood. You know, I think like for me personally, when I just out of the blue realized I want to start talking about not having kids and the journey it's taken me these last three years it's just, it's, it's a combination of wanting the entire world just to know that it's a choice, whether they have kids or not, at least be aware and also to normalize it that one day we won't have to have these conversations because, you know, the person next door who has 20 kids will look at the person who's got no kids and go, oh, okay, that was a choice. Cool. My kids know I have a choice. I mean, at the end of the day, that's like the bet for me, the best case scenario is that everybody is cool with the fact that some people, people don't want to have kids and they don't have to. And therefore, hopefully less people are being born out of obligation. You know what I mean? Because yeah. that's, I see, seen too much of that. People being born out of obligation. Yeah. Because, you know, the person had to felt like, well, I got married and this, my husband wants a kid. So I'm going to give him a kid. I'm related to people like that, yeah. you know? And so they became, they became mothers out of obligation and that was their choice. But you know, too many people. Yeah. Like I, my, 
I think of my grandmother who had 11 children. And the reason she had 11 children is because there was no birth control. So again, they're there at my aunts and uncles or my dad, they're out of obligation. I mean, that just happens. It's, yes, it's natural apparently, but there's things you can do, right? Like it's just, I, I think it would, it would just be, well, I know it would, if people didn't feel like they had to have kids and could make their choice and feel supported in their choice to not have kids, it would be better for everybody. Yeah. The child-free communities and the anti-natalist communities are still very separate and often at odds with one another, still very much an oil and water type of relationship. What are your feelings on that? I think lack of understanding, possibly. Um, Like I shared before, you know, I didn't before talking to Amanda and speaking with more people in the antinatalism community and just, just person to person, not necessarily about antinatalism, you know, the first impression for me is like angry or because I saw something like a meme or whatnot, whatnot. And a lot of people don't even know what that word is. I remember one time I mentioned it to my dad and he wanted to hear nothing about it. My dad's really cool with talking about like me being child-free and, and the work I'm doing. But the minute I started to explain a bit of, because I think I was told him that we had Amanda on the show and he just like went like, okay, cool, great. <laughs> like didn't want to hear anything about it. But it's, you know, as I'm learning, it's not, to me, I don't, I don't feel it's an angry position. It's, it's actually quite intelligent. There's a lot to think about. And I, I don't know necessarily what the perception of antinatalism like t- t- towards child-free people is, you know, because I do get to speak. Actually, a lot of people who join um, child-free morning chat from India are antinatalism, antinatalists. Mm-hmm. So I've learned a bit, but I don't really know specifically what the, the community thinks of child-free people if we're just too wishy-washy. Like, I don't know. I really don't know. And, I, and that, and that's there, there you go. That's, that's the answer. We need to know more, more about each other. That's yeah. why we're at odds. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> because, actually why I joined yeah. your, uh, clubhouse, um, conversations was because I mm-hmm. wanted to so I actually can't answer that question either about what the antinatalist community would view child free as what I do know as being um, in some of the online communities though I don't last too long um, within like say discord or reddit or twitter yeah. or anything like that I noticed that whatever group or community um, I guess yeah you could use those Uh, whatever group you're part of, I can agree with, say, the ethics or the ideology behind it. But the people online can sometimes skew what uh, I considered a compassionate position to hold. So, for example, we were talking about feminism, and I noticed, uh, you know, you you winced at some things that you've seen uh, within the feminist sphere, Mm -hmm. Um, that would come across as angry and hateful. Um, And I've seen, and another thing that I advocate for with feminism is also veganism. And there's a whole, there's a whole vegan stereotype, right? Yes. And add on top of that, antinatalism. Now, when I was uh, a moderator in some antinatalist forums, some child-free people would come, come in and they used the term breeder quite frequently in a derogatory term. Mm -hmm. And it became, uh, some of them were uh, hating on parents and children. And as someone who came through antinatalism, as someone who's like trying to prevent suffering, it's because I care about children and I care about other sentient beings on this earth. And um, this is not the the tone or the environment that I felt like was uh, being fostered. so I had that negative bias and I knew it was a bias. I knew it was, it was not rational. It was selected. It was selected yeah. for by a preliminary screening of seeing some vocal child-free people. And the thing is, whenever you see these movements, it's usually the squeakiest wheel that gets the oil, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so people that are much more, um, I don't know what to call it, like more calmer or, or not as uh, more tactful <laughs> will um, yeah. not necessarily get a lot of spotlight per se. Mm-hmm. So uh, when I joined, I was like, okay, I got this negative bias with the child-free stuff because I've, I've seen so much angry stuff posted 
Um, and then, yeah, when I joined the chats, it was just, everybody was supportive. Um, and uh, yeah, there was a positive community um, that you fostered. And, uh, and even the podcast, like it's, 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 it's setting a tone where mm-hmm. it's welcoming, it's inviting, um, and you allow a diversity of um, thoughts and it's a no judgment zone but Mm -hmm. with healthy boundaries. Yes. And that's what I really liked about it. And uh, it's definitely uh, changed my um, perception and I wanna thank you for that. Well, that's that's really awesome to hear. And I mean, what you just said is really the way to answer that question you asked me previously about what's your intent. That is the intent (laughs) is because we are aware of the, a lot of the negativity that's out there in the community. And, And you know what, there's a place and a need for people to vent about things because when you are pushed into a pronatalism corner, you're going to fight back. But unfortunately, when people are curious about being child-free or trying to gain some understanding for whatever reason, and they come across that, that angriness, that bitterness, like what you experienced, it, 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 they're like, oh, well, everyone's like this. Well, I want nothing to do with it. It's no different than me seeing something really, really harsh that an antinatalist posted. Because, I mean, there's a lot of funny, really, really crazy things out there. It's like, whoa, okay, they're hilarious and possibly true. But it makes me go, okay, this is this is a lot. <laughs> um, so, you know, really, it's it's having more spaces where people can, regardless of how you view, like what your view is, you can be a part or listen to the conversations and gain your own understanding. And that, and hopefully by some of us doing it that way, it's not, it's not going to make everybody happy, but at least it might inspire somebody else to, to, to foster their own community in that fashion. Meaning they can have a difference, difference of opinion, offer different viewpoints. And, and it's not all, there's a place for anger, but putting like doing it in a constructive way, you know, um, and, and you have to be intentional when you're creating your spaces and, and with all the things that we've done very much from the get-go, it was done with intention. Like, you know, we're not here to censor people, but like you said, healthy boundaries, respectful space. And you know what, for the most part, people have been really good about that yeah. because it just makes for a nicer experience for everyone. Exactly. You know? Yeah. For the... I don't know how to put this, the marketing or the branding of the child-free movement, do you feel that it does uh, focus mostly on women or um, at least that's like my preliminary thing when I, when I look into it, it's like, um, it seems to be, uh, I don't see a lot of child-free men groups. Maybe there are, but uh, I just I haven't come across it. There, there, there really isn't. Um... It's very new. And as someone who loves business and, you know, gets excited by like, I'm, I'm not an expert marketer, but I've learned a lot in the last three years. It's a wide open field for child free everything right now. There's very few people that are in because it's, it's not it's it's very niche, right? So to say like the <laughs> branding right now, it, it's so new, there almost is no brand. Um, the default, it's more of a default setting. The default setting is for women. And I really wasn't aware of this until we started Clubhouse, but it's the default is white women. So there's a lot of groups, whether it's secret, like secret groups or paid membership groups, it's form up or, you know, everyone's trying to build a community. It's mostly been up until recently from the white female perspective. And women only, women only, like cis women only. Uh, you know, in the last two years, I've seen more, a few more, not many, but a few more people of color speaking up, building communities specifically for, you know, African-American women. But again, it's all been for women. <laughs> so enter last year, Cody and Jared into my life. And these are two child dudes who just have this random idea to do a conference. And working with them, I was like, oh my, like there's, there's, I think really because men don't get as much pushback for not wanting to have kids. So they're kind of like, ah, 
Why do they need to talk about it? But there are men that have things to say. And it's funny because we are in a time where men are supposed to shut up and just listen. (laughs) But in this particular topic, I'm like, we need more guys speaking up because we all need to be speaking up about whether it's antinatalism, whether it's child-free, you know, the fact that there's no kids involved, we need to be talking about it, not just women. And men do know how to get things done when there's a woman pushing them, <laughs> that's a joke. But, you know, I mean, it's, I've benefited a lot being a, like we're collaborating with child-free guys as I have co- working, like ch- collaborating with child-free women. And nobody seems to do that. So I'm really hoping like with the conference and, you know, like what you and Amanda are doing and even seeing more guys creating things for the community. Cause there are, there are a handful of men that have written books on, on the, on the topic, you know, not just from their perspective, just in general. And, you know, this whole machoism of like, Oh, you know, man has to spread their seed, has to spread his seed. And, you know, he's only a man once he has children there's a huge role for child free or antenatalist guys to speak up and talk about it amongst their peer group too. Like, you know, I, like I said, I don't want to just ever focus on one gender. We're not in this time anymore. We're moving beyond that, but you know, I, I don't know how long it will take for the child free community to pick that up, but I'm going with it because it's, it's been awesome. And I want, you know, I'm, willing to do it because it's there's a lot to be said and you know what's really really cool is when you hear a guy who lives in Pakistan talking about women's rights and standing up for women's rights Mm -hmm. that you know I mean I'm sorry I mean there's hope for humanity (laughs) you know because that's not a place where you expect that but I've been able to have been lucky enough to be a part of those conversations. Yeah. Um, and right there, I'm like, we need more of this. We need more of that. So. Yeah. What, um, what fuels your fire for this passion of yours? <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> um, oh, I just, I've never advocated for anything before. And I, I, it's been a progression. I think when I turned 35, I just, I was tired of not standing up for myself saying like, I don't want to have kids. I'm not having kids, Quit asking me. And over like, it's been a three, a three years I've been doing this. And the more I'm able to express myself and talk to people about not wanting to have kids for whatever reason, the more I feel, oh my God, this is what I was meant to do (laughs) this is why this is why I have the personality I have this is why I am expressive and and I grew up in a cult like I've come like and and I was always an expressive kid but I grew up like I I was involved in a cult I was 25 I was born into it so which uh, which cult it has no name like it's weird (laughs) that's a whole other podcast episode (laughs) but I I've always witnessed people having to suppress who they are and by nature, I'm very stubborn. I'm very vocal. I'm very outgoing. I will stand up for what I believe in, even if no one else does, Mm. but I've never, it wasn't until I discovered the childhood conversation that more people were, that people were having it and that I wanted to talk about it. It all kind of hit. So I've, I've been, I've always been a passionate person. I've just never felt found that thing that I was like, I I was passionate about music, but not to this level. So you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's all kind of hit, like everything that I am focusing on a topic that I actually care a lot about, I had no idea I cared a lot about it. So that's the best answer I can give you because I, it, it just feels what I'm here to do. Do you incorporate your passion for music into your child-free advocacy? No, because I, I was a professional musician for a decade and it was very, it was traumatic for me when that career died. It it was kind of my choice, but didn't go the way I expected it. And I lost, like, I didn't know who I was. So I had to completely let go of that persona. And I put down my violin. I only recently just bought a piano. So I've started to, I have to learn how to like music again for myself before, because I, I see like, one day I'll have a Vegas, Vegas residency where I play music and I talk about being child-free and all that stuff. But 
I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really immersed in what I'm doing now. And music has to, I have to like music again for me and figure out how I want to express myself through music before I bring that element into it. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at the beginning stages of, of discovering music for myself again, really. Good. Well, good luck on that journey. Thanks. Um, how has your social circle, your network with your friends, family, coworkers reacted to um, your child-free work? Well, I haven't had a nine to five job in four years, so I have no coworkers. Uh, everything has shrunk since. So th again, three years ago is when I started becoming public about being child-free. And, you know, I think it, it, once I realized what kind of conversations and the, not necessarily what kind, but the quality of conversations that I was lacking in my social circle, it made my so small social circle even smaller <laughs> because I realized what kind, like who I was, what kind of conversations I wanted to have. And I don't mean just talking about being child free. I just mean people really living who they are and, and discovering who they are. And, you know, when you're sometimes you're kind of at the mercy of who you have around you and then again collaborating and becoming really busy advocating for being child free and meeting people online and in person and how I felt you know having these kind of conversations versus how I felt just hanging out with my friends that I've had forever very small circle to begin with I was like, this isn't doing it for me anymore. And again, it's not because I just wanted to sit and talk about being child free. It's just, I was starting to really finally own who I was. And when you do that, you do run on the risk of you no longer feeling connected to the people around you. Um, so, you know, like my close family is really supportive and that's just my brother, his two kids and my dad and my dad's wife who happens to be child free by choice my dad's wife. Um, my mom had passed away years ago. So, you know, they're there in my life, you know, a few people that I can really be my, who I am now with, they're still in my life. And that's about it. <laughs> and then this vast child-free community. And that's fine. Cause I've never been a group person. Like I always do things by myself. I live alone on purpose. I travel alone. I dine alone. I want to go to a movie by myself. Like I'm comfortable that way, but it has made me aware, like meeting people and stuff. There's a certain quality of, of conversation and just being that I a vibe from. And when you put yourself out there, you also lose people. So um, yeah, <laughs> it's been interesting. <laughs> when it comes to the child-free girls uh, Instagram, um, the aesthetic uh, tends to be what I've witnessed is like a classical Victorian ask a uh, meme kind of thing. Is there like a story behind that? Yes. Oh my gosh. It was Kristen was here to that, to answer that. I think, okay. So when we started, when we started the podcast, we, we knew we had to be on social media. So, you know, it was kind of, we were kind of throwing ideas back and forth. Like what can we do that stands out? Because we wanted to have original content. It was important to us because a lot of times Instagram, child for Instagram or child for anything is just kind of rehashing the same memes that are out there. So Kristen had these old postcards from like that were a hundred years old. And so she got them, you know, in digital form and we started playing around with that. And then we discovered this whole cache of like hundred year old Im images. And we just, you know, we, we collaborate on everything. We will, some will, one of us will do the wording. The other one will do the coloring or whatever. Like we don't draw them, but it's a collaborative effort and we check in to make sure we're all in agreement and then we post. And it kind of took on a life of its own because first of all, it was really original. Like nobody else was doing that aesthetic. So we just went with it. And, you know, um, you, so you asked also about the monthly newsletter. So yes, we do that once a month. Uh, I put one out last month. So we have to do one this month and that just updates on the podcast. Uh, what we're doing in clubhouse if there's anything like, per we always add like a personal element, like the three of us, what we're doing in our personal lives as well. And just, you know, a fun way for the audience to connect with us. Because again, people, there are people that don't know we're a podcast and people that just think we're Instagram. And then there's some people that have no idea what we do on Instagram. They just think we're a podcast. So 
you know, we try and bring everybody together. Um, but yeah, it was just the Victorian style thing. It was just a fun, different, unique thing that made us laugh. Because, <laughs> you know, you look at the images and you're like, oh, what can we say about this? And, you know, there's times where we incorporate current things. You know, like there's there's one where this guy is following this woman and the guy's like, motherhood, parenthood, purpose. And the woman's like, looks behind her. She's like, he's, she's like, unfollow me, you know? So it's, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's one of my favorites. So, you know, it's just, it's just a fun way to play with things. And we also do like, we're also on Twitter. So of course we don't tweet those images. We, we write. So we've turned that into memes as well for Instagram and it's, you know, topical. And we reply to people and we reply to snarky people. And it's just, it's partly bringing conversation in a fun way that memes do, you know? Um, and so, yeah, now that that vintage style is translating into merchandise, which looks so great. It's fun. I love the shirt that Kristen's wearing. Yeah, it looks great. The um, Before we wrap up, I just wanted to uh, see if you had any questions or comments, thoughts about antinatalism. Oh gosh, of course. <laughs> well, actually it's a question that you asked me kind of it's like what what do what does the antinatalism community like the broad community think about the pro, like pro choice people or child free people i mean i'm i'm so for the record i am pro choice yeah. right okay well i mean see that that's interesting to me so are you an antinatalist yes i'm okay. um, i'm a benetarian philanthropic antinatalist um <laughs> so so this is where me <laughs> I, I know that was like sorry go this, ahead this, this is like listening to that my brain is like how can be you can be how can you be an antinatalist and a pro-choice person yeah. and that's nothing on you that's on me not being completely aware well, let of me highlight something that uh, you talked about earlier about some situations where being coerced or um, pressured into procreation you could say is at least uh problematic Mm -hmm. right but you still respect the person making that choice yes so i can make the claim that i think that this choice is unethical but you have a right the right oh. overrides okay. that um that that value judgment that i would place okay on. and you know to the question that amanda had asked earlier as to why am i not an antinatalist that that answer resonates with me in the sense that it's the person's, you know, I, I feel it's the person's right to make that decision. Um, that yes, I, like, I agree that we don't need to be having that many kids. I mean, I really wish more people were aware and supportive of the choice, just to the fact that it, it is a choice, you know? Um, okay. And, and yeah, like there could be a hundred more questions for the antinatalism community. Mostly what you've already asked me, like, do you see a benefit? Does the, does the antinatalism community see a benefit in collaborating with the child free community to bring awareness together? Like again, power in numbers, right? Yeah. Like, you know, are they curious of, of, of participating in com conferences or having debate or not, not debates, not, not, not really debates, that's not my thing, but it's, yeah, it's discussions and just Panel discussions. Yeah. Yeah. Like in, in a way that, that elevates the conversation that is seen beyond the communities that we represent or advocate for, because I feel, and I don't know if the antinatalism community feels this way, but do you, does the antinatalism community, do you want to be more mainstream? Do you want to break out into mainstream? Like, is that something that, that is of interest? Mm. When it comes to community stuff, I feel like Amanda is the best person okay. to ask for that because. Those <laughs> so, so for me, I'm I'm more involved in the uh, academic literature on the philosophy. Mm, okay. Um, See, and um, Kristen would ask you those questions. The questions I <laughs> ask would be for Amanda because. But I mean, like I, I have yeah. witnessed, uh, you know, like I'm. St it's like I'm part of a community, but I've like, I didn't sign up. You know what I mean? Like there was no form. It's just, yes. I am an antinatalist, yes. so I'm by default part of it. Okay. Um, I've seen, I've seen a lot of people be, well, again, it's, it's like, I'll witness the more active vocal proponents because again, they're more vocal about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, they, they definitely want, 
um, it to be like a, a more mainstream. Um, and in terms of, for me, ethically, obviously, I, I would like less sentient beings being created into existence so that you spare those beings from um, all the, the harms of, of being, you know, of just being. Right. Um, and so, so for me, that, that would uh, be a, a good thing. But yeah, a lot of people are more activist oriented where they do want to bring it to the mainstream, uh, have it part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, there, we were talking to like, you know, some people, they have, uh, uh, they'll spread it through memes or they'll spread it through books uh, and some music, yeah, you name it. Um, a lot of art. Uh, and I know Amanda is a big proponent of, um, of the umbrella um, aspect of it. Like we should all work together for sure. Uh, for me, um, I have reservations. Mm. So my, so because I, this, this podcast has been, it's going to hit the two year mark soon. Okay. And I think every guest we've had on has a different perspective, which is good to highlight that. Obviously, yeah. like the title is called Exploring Antinatalism. Yeah. Um, and, and that was the goal to explore these different uh, viewpoints and ideas. But what I've come to, like, there are differences and there's going to be ethical differences. Mm -hmm. And I find it quite difficult to say um, so, for example, uh, um, Amanda's uh, ethilism, uh is different than my antinatalism, right? right? And your child-free choice by choice is different than my advocacy. Like, I, I actually want, I, I would say it would be a moral, it wouldn't be a duty, but it would be, um, I forgot the term, it's like supererogatory, where it's like, it goes beyond duty where it would be a, a good thing if people adopted kids. So I'm an antinatalist where I don't want new sentient beings being created into existence, but while they're here, adoption and rescuing. So like for me, I'm an anti-speciesist too. So when I'm thinking about a family unit, I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, well, if I rescue um, a dog, a cat, and I, or you ad adopt uh, a child, like these are all morally good things um right so it doesn't necessarily imply child free so you would almost look at as as at a child free person as you're wasting your time because you should actually be adopting a kid instead of not having anything to do with children no no i wouldn't that, say i wouldn't okay. say wasting your time um again there's I, I, when it comes to the child free movement i see a lot of benefits right um and particularly when it comes to uh like the liberation and, and uh, of what we talked about in terms of like feminism too. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I think that in certain cultures uh, it, can, it can be uh, pressured by both men and women mm -hmm. to procreate and have children, biological children. And I think that that really stifles people. Um, I think it is a, definitely a, a type of form of oppression. And I think the child-free movement will have um, an impact on, you know, opening people's uh, perception of their, their gender roles and stuff like that, mm -hmm. or pushing against that. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't want to like dissuade people or dissuade the movement, but I guess it's just the assumption because I, as soon as I say I'm an anti-natalist, there's a lot of assumptions. One, that yes. I, it's, a, it's about overpopulation, it's about the environment and that I hate kids mm -hmm. and that uh, I don't want kids. In fact, uh, I'm, 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 it, my main concern is about the being being created and the harms uh, that right. it would face. So there's that aspect. It's not mm -hmm. dealing with overpopulation or the environment, because even if that wasn't the case, it would, to me, it would still be uh, morally problematic. Right. Okay. And then uh, I've been in relationships with people with kids, um, and it was fine. I, I have a uh, younger uh, cousins and it was just, it was normal for me. Um, so I'm not like uh, necessarily like a child-free lifestyle. Um, okay. See, and that's an automatic assumption that I have. Antinatalists, they want nothing to do with children. Well, but that, that is the assumption you had, right? Yeah. Because, well, I mean, that's, that's the default my brain will go to. 
Yeah. Because it's like, but actually antinatalists could easily adopt kids. Yeah. And, and I think what it sounds said, like it. And I think you've said you've met a child, uh, sorry, antinatalist parents. Right? Yes. Yes. Who became, yeah, after they had kids, they're like, wait a sec, people should not be having children. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's never something that, but because they already had kids, it was like, okay. But what you just said presented something else to me going, well, that's interesting that actually antinatalism based on what you've said just now it's that you could actually foster children or adopt children like exactly you know, yeah. like an, an antinatalist could because they are caring for those that already exist whereas child-free people generally do not want to adopt because then that that, that doesn't make any sense exactly it comes yeah. up there are there is there is a part of that community that does consider adoption or dating someone with children i mean again a lot of different nuances to that but that okay See, conversation. <laughs> well, so okay, up so, your, your so here, here's it. here's the positive to uh, even though I have, I'm hesitant with like the umbrella. I don't know why I keep saying umbrella, but like it's just visual visually like this. It helps me. It makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, because there are so many variations and disagreements. I'm like, well, when 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 I say I'm an antinatalist, which there is no other term that I can think of, but sometimes I add these qualifiers because I say I'm a Benetarian because, uh, are you familiar with David Benatar? Uh, only from what you have posted on oh, uh, on, okay. on Instagram, <laughs> only because I, I read what you post. So I, I <laughs> well, don't, ask me, don't ask me to explain anything, but I am aware. Of so he's, he's an anti-natalist philosopher and sometimes he's seen as one of the popular uh, antinatalist flaws, but there are others. There are okay. others with different arguments for antinatalist. He, he offers uh, a particular set of arguments and there are other people with different arguments. So when I add the Benetarian aspect, that will separate me from say a Cabrera-esque. Um, so Julio Cabrera is another a philosopher. Um, and then when I add the philanthropic that adds to the, the the focal point of my antinatalism is on the, the the welfare or the the prevention of harm for okay. for that being mm -hmm. and um another aspect of benetarianism is that it's sentiocentric it, it it applies to it, moral consideration for both humans and animals so the breeding of animals would be also morally problematic okay um and so when i say uh you know part of a family unit can also apply to uh guardianship of say a non-human animal as well so i consider that part of a, a redefinition or a reformulation of, of what a family could be so okay that is your very specific experience. yeah it's a very specific yeah yeah because i because i was wondering because you you've all of a sudden, the question that Amanda asked, why are you not an antinatalist? So many things you just said there. I'm like, well, I like to eat meat and I want more cows to be bred. So automatically, <laughs> I can't be an antinatalist. But that that that's a very specific way of being for you. But yeah. there is that's not going to be the case for like every antinatalist. This is exactly why we didn't want to put together an antinatalist panel for this past conference, mm -hmm. because it's, there, there's because unless we had somebody who could clarify the, the nuances like you just did, the, it's this kind of conversation that we want for a, an antinatalist panel, not just a bunch of people we pulled from Reddit saying, <laughs> oh, I hate kids. Because that's what we see a lot of. We see a lot of the basic surfacey stuff when it comes to antinatalism, we meaning me. So, and, and I don't want that conversation because having a conversation with you and Amanda who are you know well versed compared to half of reddit on this subject there, there's so much to be understood right and that is the kind of information that's actually beneficial for what we we, we envision for the conference yeah. so that's why we just we just didn't want to have anything less than that than this yeah. on a panel which is why we didn't do it but that's my original answer is good enough for that but yeah. just to get really specific I want to see these kinds of nuances being presented yeah, on an think it, I, panel. I think it's absolutely so. That's that's again, again like where I see a benefit to the mm -hmm. big umbrella thing. Where if you foster a space where people can um, yes. hear the different views, then these assumptions that we make about each other can start to diminish because then yeah. it's like, okay, well, the, when you say you're child free or you say you're anti natalist, like what do you, what else does that mean? 
Like, yes. Um, and, and what are your other views on certain things? And uh, I think the only way people will understand those nuances is when we start discussing that across uh, with each other uh, through yeah. all these different communities. Exactly. Because, you know, it just, again, it's not that for me, it's never about convincing people, but it's, it's going deeper than just the, oh, child free, that means you have money and you can travel. We hear that all the time. It's bloody annoying because not everybody, not every child free person has a lot of money. You know? yeah. <laughs> I mean, someone brought it up one, one panel we did where it was a 22 year old. She's like, you know, I'm lucky if I can spend extra money on oysters for one week with my friends. Like, you know, there's, it, it's, it's these blanket statements that I think every, anyone that belongs to any community gets a blanket statement. Like yeah. all women want to have kids or all men are dumb, like whatever, you know, and, and it's not true. So it's, it's exactly like, it's, it's cre all about creating spaces where people can share their experience. It's going to be varied from person to person. And that's the point because it's, you get enough perspectives. Someone will listen who has never heard of antinatalism or ethelism or child-free anything and go, wait a sec. Oh my God. That, that totally makes sense. And I kind of see myself in that, like yeah. agree with that. And then they can start they at least have a way of reaching out to somebody or writing about it to themselves or buying a book or whatever, you know, I mean, that's, it's, again, it's awareness yeah. and done in a way that's, that's beneficial because, you know, you have a lot of things to share and you should be able to share your experience and you are in like creating this platform that you and Amanda have done. And, you know, it allows you to have conversations with different people and, you know, that's, I, again, I think that also fuels a passion for myself. It's like, oh my God, I'm actually able to say the things that I've been wanting to say forever. And also having discussions with people about it and listening to what they have learned and learning from them. And that's like the coolest thing ever. You know, I never want that to end. I agree. But we can, we can wrap up this conversation. Yeah, we can wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but I'm just saying like that it, it's, it's amazing. And, and the more we do it, you know, those of us that are willing to put ourselves out there, it will inspire other people to do that too. Yeah. I want to thank you for your time and for sharing your thoughts. I really appreciate it. And all, all three of you have been great guests. And yeah, I just want to say um, thank you for being our guests on the Exploring Antinealism podcast. You're absolutely welcome. This has been super, super fun. Please visit Child Free Girls at childfreegirls.com, subscribe to them on YouTube, make sure to follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can purchase their book on Amazon and check them out on Clubhouse. All this and more in the description below. The final deadline to submit your film or video to Antinatalism International's inaugural year of the Antinatalist Film Festival is fast approaching. To be a part of this historic, first-of-its-kind event, make sure to check the link in the description to visit our Film Freeway page and submit your work before the final deadline on November 1st today. Please contact me at antinatalnews at gmail.com with any questions and keep an eye on the Antinatalism International Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages for more news on the festival as well as news about the final Antinatalist Film Festival info session, which will be held on October 20th on Zoom. And proudly announcing, this upcoming info session will include an exclusive interview with the director of the short anti-nature documentary film, Effluent Seals, Service and Furnace. The Antinatalist Film Festival will be held on the Antinatalism International website December 1st through December 31st. We are so excited to present to you some of the finest video work our community has to offer. Submit today to have your work considered. Thank you for listening to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. This has been Amanda Oldfan Sukunik and Mark J. Maharaj. You can find Mark on the YouTube channel Question Mark, and I can now be found on the channel Antinatal Wolf. Keep up with my daily antinatalist news updates at Antinatal News on Twitter. Please follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And the podcast can also be listened to on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Buzzsprout, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Amazon.com, and so many other platforms. Email us at exploringantinatalism at gmail.com. Our website, www.exploringantinatalism.com, was designed by the incredible Visions Noirs. Please visit him 
him at www.bionewar.com and also follow him on Instagram. Logo art by The Amazing Life Sucks. Please subscribe to him on YouTube, and if you would perhaps like to purchase one of the new Exploring Antinatalism t-shirts by Life Sucks, then check out his Etsy at www.etsy.com slash shop slash Life Sucks Publishing. Music donated by The Amazing I Doubt It. Please subscribe to him on YouTube, and please check out our collaborative project with our friend Danny Thomas on the YouTube channel The Right to No Longer Exist, as well as a couple of other links below. All the best, and bye for now!